All right, go ahead and pause the video here for a moment and give this one a shot. For each of the following compounds, state whether it is ionic or covalent or an acid. And if it is ionic, write the symbols for the ions involved. Okay, so this is really important to be able to look at a chemical formula and determine if it's ionic, covalent, or an acid. And acids are covalent, by the way. They're a special type of covalent compound that we call an acid. So we'll get to that a little bit more in the next section or two. Uh, but remember to make the distinction between ionic and covalent, we look for whether the elements in the formula are metals or nonmetals. If an element in a formula is going to be a metal, it's always going to be the first element in the compound. Metals are never listed last. Metals are always listed first. So when we're determining if a compound is an ionic compound or a covalent compound, it's important to know what the, whether each element in the formula is metal or nonmetal, but the metals are always going to appear first. So we really just have to look at the first element in each of these compounds to determine whether it's ionic or not. And all we have to do is look at that first one and ask, is it a metal? So let's bring our periodic table back. Okay, potassium. Here's potassium. Potassium is left. Let's redraw our, um, our zigzag line that separates the metals from the nonmetals. That goes right here. All right, so um, potassium is on the left of that line. That means it's a metal. So if that is a metal, then I say this is an ionic compound. All right, let's do the next one. Magnesium. Magnesium is here, an alkaline earth metal. It's a metal. It's in the name of the family. And it's also to the left of that zigzag line. If that first element is a metal, then this compound is ionic. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is here on the left of that line, but it's green. It's kind of out of place. Hydrogen is not a metal. Hydrogen is a gas. So therefore, if this is not a metal, then this must be covalent. And this is a, um, a special case of a covalent compound that begins with H. Therefore, it's an acid. So anytime a compound, a formula begins with the element H, then we consider that to not only be covalent, because that's not a metal, but it's also considered an acid. H2S starts with H, so it's an acid. Okay, the next one, silver. Silver is a transition metal in the periodic table, right here. So silver is a metal, so this is ionic. Um, nitrogen. Nitrogen is right up here. Nitrogen is on the right side of that line. It's non-metal, so this is covalent. And finally, cobalt. Cobalt is a transition metal right here. As a metal, that makes this compound ionic. All right, so now it says, if it's ionic, write the symbol of the ions involved. So now we've got to look at these compounds and determine which ions are in there. So let's do that in a different color here. So we've already got the, the cation, the metal. So let's circle the anion in each of our ionic compounds. Remember, an ionic compound consists of a cation and an anion. So if we've identified the cation as that one atom, the K, everything else must be part of the anion. We can't leave anything out. There can't be more than a cation and an anion. That has to be the total, the totality of the compound. So in the second one, I have magnesium is the cation. So this whole thing must be the anion. All right, in D, silver is the cation. So here's my anion. And in F, cobalt is the cation. So this whole thing must be my anion. Remember, when an anion contains more than one atom, like these do, 
like like at least three of these do. They're called polyatomic ions. Polyatomic meaning they have more than one atom. Um, this one here in D is just a sulfur atom. That's a monoatomic ion. It just has one atom, S. Uh, but the top one has ClO4. It has five atoms, four oxygen atoms and one chlorine. So that's a polyatomic ion. So now we're not done because they want us to write the symbol of the ion. So to write the symbol of an ion, I need to know not only what atoms are involved, but what the charge is. So how do I look at this compound and know what the charge is? So let's start with A. Remember that in um, the first column of the periodic table, we can say that each of the elements in this first column always get a charge of plus one if they become ions. And we can say that all of the elements in the second column always get a charge of plus two. And then we can come over here and say these are all plus three. The carbon one it becomes plus or minus four. And the nitrogen's minus three, minus two, minus one, and the noble gases are zero. So remember, it's important to um, keep track of this pattern along the periodic table that works for all the main group elements. We can't do this in the transition, but we can look at main group elements this way. So K is right here. It's plus one. So I know that K is plus one. That's the symbol for potassium cation. Now I have ClO4. What's its charge? Well, I know that in an ionic compound, pluses and minuses have to cancel. They have to be equal. So if K has a plus one charge, then ClO4 has a minus one charge. So here are the two ions that make up this ionic compound. Let's do the next one, Mg. Mg is right here, has a plus two charge. So we write Mg2 plus. Um, the correct way to write this is to put the number first and then the charge. But sometimes, um, and I'm guilty of this probably more than most people, I will write plus two instead of two plus. Um, so the, the, the proper way is to write the number first, but sometimes I mix it up and write the plus first. They mean the same thing. So magnesium, two plus, is the cation. And then let's write our anion here. Um, and let's keep track this time. I have two of these anions. I know that. How come I didn't have four of these up here? Well, because ClO4 is one of those. If I had four, then I would have to put ClO4 in parentheses and put a four on the outside of the parentheses. That would indicate that I have four of those. But since that wasn't the way that this was indicated and there were no parentheses, that indicates that ClO4 is part of one group and I only have one of them. So down here, C2H3O2 in parentheses and outside of the parentheses a two, that implies I have two of these C2H3O2. It's called acetate. C2H3O2, one of them, C2H3O, so weird, three, O2, two of them. So now I have two of these ions. You can circle them just so we keep track of our ions here. So if a magnesium has a two plus charge, and I have two of these acetate anions, and it has to equal zero when I add up all their charges, then their charges must be minus one each, right? Because then I have minus one, but there's two of them, so then I really have minus two, and then I have plus two and minus two, it equals zero. So then that's how I would write the ions for that compound. Let's do the next one, silver. And now look, here's the subscript here. Now I have two silvers, so let's write two silvers. And then my anion is S. So silver, silver, S. Now what are the charges on these? Look at silver. It's right here. Uh-oh, that's in the transition elements. I don't know what the charge on silver is because the, tr the charge on transition elements can change. So I can't look at its position in the table and say, oh, that must be plus one or that must be plus two. I can do that with main group elements. So look, here's sulfur. Sulfur is a main group element. 
It's in the minus 2 column. So that tells me that sulfur has a charge of 2 minus. So if my anion is minus 2, and I have two negative charges, that means I need two positive charges to balance it out to equal 0. So that tells me that the charge on each silver must be plus 1. So now I have plus 1 and plus 1, that equals plus 2. And plus 2 and minus 2 cancel out to equal 0. So this would be a neutral ionic compound when, when I add up all the charges. All right, let's do the last one. CO is one of my ions. Now keep track of the parentheses and the uh, subscript on the outside. The 2 indicates that I have two NO3 ions. And now let's try to figure out the charge on these. Cobalt. Uh-oh. Cobalt is a transition element. I don't know what its charge is. NO3. Uh-oh. I can't look at N and O on here to determine what the charge on an NO3 is, because N is in the 3 minus column, and O is in the 2 minus column. So on this one, I don't have a lot of... Uh, a lot of information to work with from the periodic table. It's not really helping me. But the subscripts here do give me some idea. I know that this is a 1 to 2 ratio. So whatever the charge on cobalt is, it must be two times bigger than the charge on nitrate, because I need twice as many nitrates to equal that charge. So here's a little trick that we can do. We've looked at the switcheroo, is what I call it, where we turn charges into subscripts. Well, we can do the reverse switcheroo and turn subscripts into charges. So let's try that move over here. So I want to know, after I separate these, what do they look like? If I write CO and NO3 and I pull them apart, what do they look like when they're separated? Well, the, the subscript from nitrate becomes the charge on the cobalt. I know that cobalt's a cation, it comes first. What's its charge? Well, it has the charge equal to the subscript of the anion. What's the charge on the anion? It has a charge equal to the subscript of the cation, which in this case is 1, minus 1. So the charge on cobalt is plus 2, and I know that because I have two nitrates. And the charge on nitrate is minus 1, and I know that because I have one cobalt. So then I come back over here and fill in these charges and make sure this works. 2 plus, minus, minus. So I have a 2 plus charge, and a minus 1 plus a minus 1, which is minus 2. And a 2 plus and a minus 2 is 0. They cancel out. Okay, for each of the following pairs of ions, write the formula of the compound they will form. Go ahead and pause the video here for a minute and give this one a shot. All right, for each of the following pairs of ions, write the formula of the compound they will form. So um, let's use the tactic that I call the switcheroo here. So whenever I'm writing a formula of an ionic compound, the cation always has to come first in the formula. We always write the most metallic thing, or the most positive species comes first. So they're written that way already. The cation is written first, and then comma, and then the anion. So when we write our formula, we're going to put the elements in the same order because we have to put the, the cation first. Now, to finish the formula, what I have to do is fill in the subscripts. So um, I know that there's a plus 1 charge on K and a minus 2 charge on oxygen. So I can think of it this way. Those charges have to balance so that they cancel out, because a 1 plus and a 1 minus add together to equal 0. They become neutral. 
So ionic compounds, their charges always balance so that they cancel out and, this, and the compound by itself is neutral. So if I have a plus one charge and a two minus charge, right now they're not canceling because those charges are not the same. I have tw two times more oxygen, or two times more negative than positive. So if, what I really need here is two plus. Because if I have two plus and I have two minus, then two plus and two minus will cancel to equal zero. How do I get two plus? Well, I need to have two of these potassium ions. And if I have two potassium ions, then I will uh, have the, then I'll have a two plus charge, which cancels the two minus. So to indicate that I have two potassiums in a formula, I write the two as a subscript. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying this, K plus, K plus, O two minus. This is what this compound looks like. There's two potassiums, because they're, they only have plus one charge each, and there's one oxygen that has a two minus charge, and this group of ions right here cancels out to equal zero. Two plus, two minus. All right, so um, we can, let's do that same thing here. I have NH4, so this has a polyatomic in it, and then I'm going to write PO4 right next to it. This is what they look like when they're separated, right, up above, their ions. And when they come together, then their charges disappear because we assume that they're neutral. So this one looks weird because it already has subscripts. All right, NH subscript 4, PO subscript 4. So this one already has subscripts. So how do I, how do, I do this? Is this one done? Well, it's not done because I have a plus 1 charge and a 3 minus charge, and those don't equal each other. They don't balance. So they don't cancel out, so I can't be done. How do I make them balance? Well, I need to get more of this one. Right now, I only have plus one. I need to have plus three. Plus three would balance with minus three, and they would cancel to equal zero. So how do I show that I need three times more of this one, NH4? Well, it looks like I wrote this a little bit too close, so let me move it over a little bit. If I need three NH4s, then I need to do this. I put NH4 in parentheses, and I show that I need three of them. And then right after that, I write my PO4. I only need one PO4, because that PO4 has a three minus charge. But I need three NH4s, because each NH4 only has a plus one charge. So when I have three of them, then I have a plus 3 charge, and plus 3 and minus 3 equals 0. So this is how I'm going to write this one. I have to, when I have a polyatomic and I need more than one of those polyatomic ions, I always have to put them in parentheses. Because let's see what happens if I don't have the parentheses there. It's going to look weird. It's going to say... NH43PO4. So if I don't put the parentheses in there first, then it looks like I have 43 hydrogen atoms. But that's not what's happening. I don't have 43 hydrogens and one nitrogen. When I put the parentheses in, it totally changes how we interpret this. Oh, it's not 43 hydrogens. It's 4 times 3. It's 12 hydrogens. So the, the parentheses are very important when I'm writing the formula of uh, a polyatomic ion. All right, let's try another tactic. So on this one, I have a 3 plus and a 2 minus. If I have two 3 pluses, then I have 6 plus. Well, that's still not equal to 2 minus. If I have two 2 minuses, then I have 4 minus. Well, that's still not equal to 3 plus. So in this one, it's, it's harder to get the charges to balance. I don't just double or triple one of them to get them to equal to get them to equal out like I did in the last one. So in this one, I have to find the lowest common denominator. It happens to be 6 here, right? Because if I have two aluminums, then I have 6 plus. And if I have three oxygens, then I have 6 minus. So 6 is the first number that they both share. So I can do that. Two aluminums is 6 plus. Three oxygens, that would give me this, 2, 3. 
Um, and it's important to be able to think this way so that we know why those subscripts are there, so the charge is balanced. But I want to show you a trick. Aluminum has a charge of 3 plus. That number can become the subscript on my anion. The charge of the cation becomes the subscript of my anion. And vice versa, the charge of my anion becomes the subscript of my cation. So we can do the old switcheroo here. And this almost always works. There is one case where it doesn't. Um, I'll say, yeah, when, when both of the numbers are even is the only time that this won't work. So if I have O2 minus and Mg2 plus, and both of those numbers are even, then this switcheroo trick doesn't work because then I'd get 2 and 2, and it would look like my formula is supposed to be Mg2O2, but that's not right because the, these are already balanced. A 2 plus and a 2 minus are already balanced. I don't need two of each of them, I just need one of each of them. So the right formula for Mg2 plus O2 minus is MgO, not Mg2O2. So this trick that I just showed you, the switcheroo is what I call it, the switcheroo does not work when both numbers are equal, or excuse me, when both numbers are even. So we can look at another example where that happens, where both numbers are even. If I have lead 4 plus and sulfide 2 minus and I try to stick these together and I do the switcheroo then it's going to imply that my formula is PB2S4 but that's not right either because if I have a 4 plus and a 2 minus all I really need is two of these because if I have two sulfurs then that would balance the charge. I'd have 4 minus, 4 plus and 4 minus. So when I generate this formula down here, the reason that it's wrong is because I can write, divide each of these by 2, and I would get P, B, S, 2. So in a previous video, we were working on the difference between molecular formula and ionic, or excuse me, molecular formula and empirical formula. And remember, this is kind of like the empirical formula, where it's the simplest whole number ratio of atoms. Ionic compounds are always given in empirical formulas. If I can make the numbers smaller in an ionic formula, I must make them smaller. That's always the rule. Um, so in ionic form, in, for ionic compounds, we can say that the molecular formula and the empirical formula are equal. They're always the same because we always have to make those numbers reduce them to the smallest whole numbers possible, like I just did right here. Okay, that was a bit of a tangent, so let's continue on with, with the rest of these. Okay, Na, my cation comes first. And then I write my anion right next to it. I just squeeze them together. They're apart first, and then to write the formula, I squeeze them together, and then I have to figure out how to put the subscripts in. So I have 1 plus, and I have an anion with a charge of 2 minus. So that means I need two sodiums. If I have two sodiums, then I'd have 2 plus, and that would balance the charge on carbonate, which would be 2 minus. So I need 2 here, and then I have Na2CO3. Um, or I can use the switcheroo here, right? If I put this down here, that shows me that I have a subscript of 2. And if I move this down here, you might say, well, wait, that looks like a 3. But remember, we're not looking at the subscript that's contained within the polyatomic ion. We're imagining that we only have one of these polyatomic ions, and the one sits outside of the parentheses. But since I don't actually have to write parentheses or the subscript 1, it's just implied, then I leave those parentheses off. So this just becomes Na2CO3. I need one of those carbonates. All right, let's do the last one. Barium and phosphate, and I'll stick those together. They're apart, I bring them together. A two and a three. Well, that means just like in C, 
the lowest common denominator here is going to be a 6. So I can use that understanding to figure out what the numbers are, or I can use the switcheroo. just wanted to write these a little bit closer together here. All right, if I do the switcheroo, then it shows that I need two phosphates, so I need to put this in parentheses and put a 2 out here, and I need three bariums. So then I would put the 3 here by barium. So let's make sure this works. If I have 3 bariums, then I have a total plus charge of 6. And if I have 2 phosphates, then I have a total minus charge of 6 minus. 6 plus and 6 minus is 0.